Maybe it's not brushes. Maybe it's devices that are getting used inside of these devices. Maybe it's different chemicals, ways that these devices are manufactured. I, but I don't know exactly what it'll be, but I think there's going to be a lot of things that will help us be better collectively as, as a whole, you know, healthcare collab. Rising above the ultrasonic cleaners and the clanking of stainless steel are the ideas and voices that are changing an industry. You're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for people, processes and products that are improving our sterile processing world. Each week we speak with frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you're tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad you did. Now turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go Beyond Clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Andy Sundit, Sales and Marketing Manager at Claris Medical LLC, and we are going to be talking about boroscopes today, Hank, and I'm excited to not only talk about how important the technology is, but once you have it, how do you take care of it? What are some ways to make sure it gets implemented properly? We've been talking about what the maintenance requirements is. How do we take care of this expensive equipment that is in our departments? I'm looking forward to talking to Andy. I know he's a passionate guy. And kind of randomly, I got to meet Andy's dad at the conference in San Antonio this year, the HSPA conference. He was there at the booth. And he's also a very passionate, fun guy. So I know this interview is going to be very educational, but also you know, driven from somebody who really cares about the impact of this kind of equipment in sterile processing and ultimately to the patient. So yeah, let's go on and get into this thing, Justin. Well, we're all about the passion here. We're going to be right back with Andy Sundet after a short break. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Hank Balch. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Andy Sundet, Sales and Marketing Manager at Claris Medical LLC, and we're going to be taking a closer look at Boroscopes, Hank, another well-titled episode as we are in <laughs> Season 17. Oh, yes. And Andy, I want to welcome you to the show. I know we've done a lot together, you know, including an SPX in the past, and I just wanted to welcome you to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we, we love working with you guys. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. But I'm really uh, excited to be here with you today. So, Andy, why don't you just talk more about your background? Introduce yourself to the audience and, and tell them a little bit about Claris Medical. I'm, I'm going to, spoil alert, I'm pretty sure there's something about boroscopes in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so we, we are a endoscope company. We're good at packaging light and optics solutions in small packages, flexible, rigid, single use, reusable. That's just what we're good at. And so we, we've kind of stumbled into boroscopes for this purpose. But know that we have devices that are used in human procedures. So, you know, airway management, spine procedures, neuro procedures. So, yeah, that, that's a little background. But we, we make these devices in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Been around for a long time. We've got people that have been with the team for 20 plus years. So I hope that passion kind of carries through. We like doing what we do. That's some phenomenal tenure. By the way, I mean, you'd, especially in today's day and age, I just have to give you a little bit of shout out for that. I love seeing a company that can really hold on, you know, to the team members that have helped build the organization. So I just I have to give you a nice hat tip on that one. And, you know, I realize we're talking about flexible scopes, and I'm assuming that our entire audience knows what a boroscope is and how it serves a unique purpose versus some of the devices that you just mentioned that are used during actual procedures on patients. You know, what makes the boroscope unique and what's its, what's its purpose and how did this market emerge? So 
and, and I think this is correct, but I've heard it from multiple people. So I'm going with it, but a, a boroscope, an endoscope is, is a essentially a boroscope, but it's used inside a human body. A boroscope is, is, is basically that, but used anywhere outside. So you see boroscopes used in jet engines. You see them used to inspect pipes. Our boroscopes are used in tons of industries that are totally on healthcare related. So pretty much anything you can find that you want to put a camera into, that's what a boroscope will be for. You can get pretty creative these days too. I want to ask you just a random kind of side trail here, but you mentioned the single use scope market, I guess, and there's a lot of applications for that. What's your take on that kind of market opportunity and the future of that market. Obviously, in sterile processing, we're paying a lot of attention to the single-use endoscopes, those large diameter endoscopes, and even some of like the single-use bronchoscopes and stuff coming out. Are we seeing the upswing? Is there still a couple of years until it's really going to start disrupting the market? Well, I think that's a great question. I don't have all the answers, but you know, my read is that the endoscope and reprocessing industry has been learning a lot and developing a lot over the last few years. I believe that one of the things that is actually helping drive this innovation is the increased use of borescopes, not only at hospital locations, but also industry design and manufacturing and repair companies using these devices to kind of learn these borescopes to learn a lot about what's going on inside of lumens. So a couple of takeaways, I guess, as we shift to potentially some single use, you know, I think first and foremost, I believe that before we we have a major single use shift and that takes hold, I think there's a lot of significant advances to reprocessing, you know, that we can help make happen and, and believe that boroscopes can help identify some of those points for improvement. You know, I guess as it relates to single use, I think there's some very critical devices used in hospitals that I, I do think makes sense to make a transition to single use or single-use components to those devices. And I think that we will start seeing those significant movements in the next couple of years. But Justin, as you said, I mean, and as myself being a new father, I, I'm really watching the environmental impact. So it's something that, you know, I think a lot of the heavy hitter companies are really figuring out potential solutions for, you know, being environmentally friendly with a single-use shift. And I think it's something that we're all going to be watching for over the next couple of years. I mean, Justin, I want to throw to you. Didn't you just do an interview about like the greening of healthcare and, and that like that ecological impact hasn't been really discussed yet, I think, on this channel in the context of that scope argument. But do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I mean, we did an interview on the Power Supply podcast with Practice Green Health which is just focused on sustainability. They're based in the Pacific Northwest. They just had a huge conference in the beginning of May, and they're focused on that. I can't speak for any of the single-use device you know, companies that are developing these scopes, but I, I have to think that sustainability is a major concern and part of the understanding. You know, the other thing is there is a market out there, and you might remember this, Hank, from I believe it was still our first season – where there are companies out there that do single use device reprocessing. Now, I think the market for, you know, the flexible endoscope single use, flexible endoscopes hasn't necessarily probably hit critical mass for that kind of R and D to happen. But, you know, that is another way to look at, you know, something like a single use device in terms of sustainability is, well, wait a second, you know, can we send this to, a reprocessor that maybe is a little bit, you know, more skilled in, in that kind of work. And maybe there's more technical things that you just couldn't do within a, within a sterile processing department to reprocess a single use device like that. So I think there's a lot of approaches to it, but I mean, that is the common challenge to anything that's single use. It has everything to do with sustainability and is there a recycling program and what is the impact on the environment? And I do think that, you know, Practice Green Health is definitely an organization that has been trying to put a lot of, you know, a lot of focus on that and helping hospitals get, get down that line. So, you know, certainly that's an organization worth looking into. I'm going to tie this in, I promise, <laughs> <a little> <laughs> later, <laughs> because we're going to talk about 
the application of some of these boroscope technologies into reusable devices. So obviously, if the industry starts moving away from you know certain types of reusable devices, then the need for a boroscope in that specific instance kind of goes away as well. So we'll tie that back in here later. Before we get there, you did a good definition on you know what is this equipment? Like when we say boroscope, what do we mean? Can you let us know when and why it's needed in the sterile processing workflow or that endoscopy workflow? Like where in the field today, are you seeing folks use this technology? Obviously, these devices that we're reprocessing are complex. And now, you know, me being probably newer than a lot of listeners to the industry, they're a lot more complex than I ever thought they would be on the inside. And so I, I think why, you know, the big question is why? Well, I think technology now allows us to do it. That doesn't mean you should always do it, but to be inspecting the outside for all these years, I'd argue 50% of the devices now on the inside, why would we be missing half the inspection? So technology is there. I think it makes a lot of sense from that aspect. And I think right now, now that boroscopes have been out and much more prevalent over the last 10 years, some of these studies by some, I think just phenomenal research that's been done, pointing out, hey, this was a, this was a patient ready scope or device, and, and this is what it looked like. Are, are we okay with that? And so I, I think the findings has then led to more industry talk, you know, things changing on guidelines and IFUs. So I, I think that's the why to me. I do th- obviously we're a little biased on thinking it's a it's a really neat tool to help with this, but I think there is some really deep whys behind it. The when and where those are questions that that I think we're all working towards every department I go into is a little bit different. You know, it looks different. The layout's different. The devices that are going through there are different. So, you know, we're seeing them used on the clean side, the dirty side, and both. I think there's really good pros and cons for both of those. Yeah, I think some pros and cons, especially on the dirty side, because I can just imagine some people out there being like, oh, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, with using a scope that needs to, you know, a style of scope that needs to be clean inside of a scope that's dirty. (laughs) You know, how do we, I I can see a paradox emerging in some people's (laughs) minds. So I think, I think going over the pros and cons of that is, is a great idea. Yeah. So, you know, dirty side, I think, my my thought on the biggest pro is that you're going to hopefully catch something earlier before you waste time reprocessing the device. That to me stands far and above the, the biggest pro. The the cons, you know, there's a lot going on in, in that area in decon. There's moisture present. Sometimes there's other things present there that make it difficult to have, I think, a, a clear, clear inspection. Moisture is not a problem for most boroscopes. You can have water present, but bubbles, you know, other chemicals or even residual things that need to be cleaned out of there first. That would be a con in my mind, just a lot going on in that side. On the clean side, we usually see there is, is I think the good word is an audit tool. Hey, these are patient ready devices. Let's see how things are working. I mean, the department does so many things. There's so many moving parts to reprocessing devices. Let's let's see how these things are all working together to do the job that we think it's doing. Downside is, as you're bringing it up, I mean, if we catch something late, we got to start all over again with reprocessing the device. That, that's a bummer. Um, not ideal. I think we're all pretty happy to catch something there, but that is certainly a little bit slower of a process to re-go back and do everything. The other side is if we do encounter something, then we, you know, the boroscope has to be dealt with. And I think most boroscope offerings out there do have solutions for that, whether it's certain kinds of cleaning compatibility that they offer. Most boroscopes are even waterproof, so they could go through you know, wow. washer disinfectors. That's really uncommon, though. What you just said is really kind of, I think, would be a surprise to a lot of people that you could run the boroscope through a washer disinfector, which is a, a huge advantage, honestly. And it kind of addresses that paradoxical concern that I said might kind of run out there is, hey, you know what? After it's been used, the last thing you want to do is is pass it through a dirty channel Right. And then put it into another scope and pass it through as well. You know, there's that sort of cross contamination kind of thought process that might come up. So, you know, just like brushes, 
on many of the brushes on the on the dirty side can go through the washer disinfector. Not all, but many can. The ones that can that helps make those you know more ready for use in in the in the cleaning process. So I think that's a huge that's a huge advantage and something I would not have thought. I would not run a scope through the washer disinfector. So that's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, we, we kind of hit why and 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 where and when. I mean, I guess the other the other when question is, you know, is it every device every time? Is it an audit tool? And you know, we see groups that are implementing boroscopes handle it multiple ways. I mean, they, sometimes they start every device every time, and they kind of get some feedback that you know that's just let's use as an audit tool and maybe take a certain number of devices at a certain frequency and and go through with the boroscope. And then from there, they develop a plan. But I think those are all good solutions, but things um, to think about. I'll go ahead and say, because I'm not afraid to say this, I'm not saying you are, you know, but I'm going to, I'm going to step on the grenade here and say our challenge in the industry is not that we're too good at, at getting things clean. If there is a challenge, and I think a systemic challenge, it's that we're not good enough. And that process piece, you know, to get to the point to where you don't have to inspect every instrument every time, especially some of these, you know, complex instruments that you mentioned, like the arthroscopic shaving handles in particular come to mind. I can't imagine a world today in the United States that you're not looking at that handle every single time, even if you get if you're getting clean handles again and again and again because your process is so optimized across the US you know like that would be a rare exception to a rule out there of so many of those studies that you mentioned like I want to go back to that research piece those are striking results in how dirty these scopes are and the percentage of them like we're not talking like these bad hospitals over there that have like bad names and bad ratings. Like we're talking about across the board, the entire industry just cannot get these complex devices clean on a consistent basis. So I'm going to disagree with you a little. And I'm going to say, in my personal opinion, if you can (laughs) inspect and if it's a complex device that you know historically has had issues being cleaned, you should build that into your workflow and you should be inspecting that device every single time. That being said, I also want to go back to something that Justin and y'all brought up too that is really like a real life debate and challenge is that gray area or that paradox. I think was what Justin said about the using and cleaning and the potential cross contamination. And, you know, to toot our own horns here, we built a micro credential uh, specifically about cross contamination in sterile processing because that issue is such a a challenging issue. And if you look at the scope outbreaks in particular, like that's what it is. It's the bug from the last scope going into that next patient. And again, and again, the next patient, next patient, like it's just a continual chain of cross contamination. So I want to challenge the folks out there listening. We have seen some good research. The offset group is great about doing research and getting it published, but how many other names can you reference about other researchers out there publishing and talking about this issue? It's a real short list. So if you're tuning in, I want to challenge you, like get some boroscopes, do some more research on all these other devices because we need more data. And I think we need to wake even more people up than are awake today about the the real challenges and the real need out there. Okay. Off my soapboxes. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> glad I didn't have to jump on the grenade. You said you were just going to step on it. I didn't know if I had to like jump on top of it and prevent everybody from the explosion. Oh, but. man. <laughs> yeah. I just set up this whole interview just so I could say that soapbox. So now I've done it. <laughs> <You're> just, <laughs> uh, no, just kidding. Speaking of best practices on that kind of cleaning part, and that was a point well taken about it depends on the scope of the manufacturer. It depends on your internal process and, and policies. So uh, that we don't want to like write it all in stone here, but you do want to like, really consider that piece. What are some other you know, best practices in regards to training and using this equipment? And I'll kind of caveat that question by saying, 
in our consulting practice in the field, I can't tell you how many departments we have come into that have purchased a borescope at some point in in their department's life, and it's sitting in a in a cabinet or in a drawer, you know, covered in dust. No one knows where the manual is anymore, or they lost the USB plug it and so it's never used like how do we keep that from happening number one and then number two if they are using it what are those best practices that folks need to be thinking about yeah that's a terrible problem if it's just sitting there i mean that so i i think one of the reasons that we you know if there is a challenge on adoption it's you know they're concerned about what what are we going to find you know, what are we going to find? What should I be looking for? Those are some of the questions that come up. I think our discussion usually goes to, you know, hey, you, you've done this before. You, you can do this. You know, you've looked on the outside. You've found right. Every single device there. they're looking on the outside, right? They're not closing their eyes on any particular device and saying, hey, you know, that one's usually clean. I'll just close my eyes and go ahead and put that one in the tray because we trust the process on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, here's where, how we've tried to simplify it. We, I mean, this is not this is not any kind of brain surgery here that we've come up with. But I don't know what you're going to find. The permutations are are endless, but it, it's going to fall in one of four categories. It's going to be either debris, you know, something in there that does not belong. And I think with the borescope, you know, you might have been able to feel that with a brush in the past, but with the borescope, you're going to know if it's a round lumen or if there's something that's kind of hanging there and it shouldn't be. So debris is the first thing. Damage, you know, it's a lumen that doesn't look like the rest of the lumen does. You know, it's it's either kinked, there's a big scratch in it. Those are some of the real common ones that we see. You know, so damage being the second one. And, and that kind of damage, let's hope that we're catching it before it's bigger damage, right? So second thing being damage, Discoloration would be a, a third one. I'm trying to. I would try to match these all with the letter D uh, <laughs> to help make you more simple. So, debris, damage, discoloration. Discoloration could be staining. We had a lot of questions about rust or stuff that looks like rust. So, discoloration just being something where it's not the same color or shade of the rest of the lumen, and you could point that out pretty pretty easily with the borescope. Last thing, droplets, moisture moisture when it should not be present. And so those are the four categories that we put them in. They can be very wide ranging, obviously the inside, but that's what we're looking for. Something that doesn't belong or it's it's out of place or it's not the way it should be. All right. So let's get into preventive maintenance because having worked in the instrument repair business for a long time, you know, making sure that you're getting on top of the repairs proactively i mean i'm assuming these boroscopes are are a lot more sealed than maybe what we're used to with uh, a larger diameter flexible scope and the leak testing for damages to the integrity that would allow fluid but then you just said droplets so you know maybe i'm kind of waffling on the line here a little bit but what kind of preventive maintenance do the technicians and managers that are adopting this technology need to be aware of to make sure that this investment that they've made, that they take care of it and they don't wind up seeing all of these repair bills kind of climbing through the roof so that they can continue to use it? I'd say where we see damage, it's from either kinking a boroscope, you know, flexing it past its bend radius, which most of these boroscopes within the last couple of years, if you haven't looked at them, they They've gotten quite a bit more durable. And so kinking or down by the distal tip, you know, they've been pushing it through something where it just cannot take that type of bend. So that's the kinking side. The other side would be on some of these rougher lumens, it's almost like sandpaper on the inside. So boroscope companies have been learning along the way as we've been seeing more users of boroscopes. We learn what lumens they're going into, what's inside those lumens how we can build a better boroscope to handle, you know, this daily activity. So the distal tip where the camera's at and the light's at, going through, say, a suction where it's like sandpaper on the inside a thousand times in a year. I mean, that's pretty, pretty tough on a boroscope. So that's where the other damage was. And I think some of those enhancements have made them more durable. Everyone's trying to make these things more durable. 
It's very small. They are not, they don't have a working channel themselves, these boroscopes. So, you know, leak testing and, and some of this preventative maintenance that you're doing with other endoscopes it isn't really relevant. But, you know, the typical stuff that we do is, you know, make sure that you're, you're kind of making sure and visually inspecting the boroscope to make sure that there's no visible damage, kinks, breaks, tears in that flexible portion of the scope. You're inspecting the tip to make sure that there's no burrs or sharp, sharp spots on the tip. So a lot of those things that you would already have been trained to do with regular flexible scopes, whether they're small diameter OR scopes or larger diameter that are used in the GI, there's commonalities in terms of what you're inspecting for and especially that distal tip and making sure that you don't bang it off of something. You know, that's where all the expensive electronics are. That's where, like you said, the camera is and you all of a sudden you start banging that off of something. That's when you're, you're asking for it, I guess, to, to some extent. So uh, I like that there's common themes, you know, in terms of inspection points and everything else and the kind of sending them out for preventive maintenance. If you notice something minor before it becomes a major issue and really that droplets or that fluid piece is because the electronics that are in there is, is so critical. What about design consideration? So. I've not had this technology before. I know it's critical. I bring it into my department. How do I make sure that it gets installed correctly, that the workflow is good, that to the preventive maintenance piece, that we're placing it in a safe place so we're not setting ourselves up for damages just by on virtue of, oh, there was really no room in this workstation, so we kind of did this to fit it in, and then, you know, all of a sudden that results in damages. Yeah, so... I th- this is a this is a big question. We're unwrapping a lot of stuff, which is good. Picturing your process, what's important to you? What's already at the workstation? What types of devices are going to be going through this particular workstation? Meaning, what are we what are we trying to inspect? I think those are all really important. So try not to have your boroscope workstation be an afterthought. You know, if visual inspection is going to be important, make sure that the workstation has ample space. Justin, you said you know things like setting trays on a board scope. <laughs> if, there's, if there's stuff that's, you know, and I know, I know a ton of stuff goes on in these de- in the department and it's tough to always have a clean workstation, but some of these things can help protect the board scope and also just make for a lot easier and quicker inspection. And that's what we're trying to do. We don't want to delay the whole process. We want you to be inspecting, getting done with the device, moving on to the next one. So, I, I would suggest, you know, looking at the space that you have. Do you do you need a computer? Do you want a computer? Do you want to capture pictures or videos? Is that going to be important for your team in training and going back to manufacturers and asking questions about what you're seeing? That's a big question. What types of devices are you inspecting? Are they longer lumen? Are they, you know, meaning we got to we got to we're going to have to have a longer bore scope for that. And do we have room to maybe lay out that device to, mm. to even get a good visual inspection? That is a fantastic point. I, mean, I hadn't really thought about that. But yes, I mean, obviously, the smaller diameter scopes aren't nearly, you know, as long as, you know, the GI scopes. And so, you knowing the types of scopes that you're going to be inspecting, the types of scopes that are in your department And then I really like what you said about laying it out because, yeah, I can imagine if you're trying to coil it, getting the boroscope to pass through a flexible scope that's coiled is going to be a lot more difficult than having that flexible scope laid right out straight so that the channel is pretty much linear. I mean, I get it. There'll be some variation, but I can imagine it's a lot easier to pass a boroscope through a flexible scope that's that's laying out straight. Or think of it this way too. If if you got a workstation that's doing one colonoscope a year, you probably don't want to buy a super long boroscope because you're going to be dealing with that super long working length the whole time when all you're you know you're doing that once you know every once in a while. Think of the devices that you're going to be inspecting and that kind of frequency that you're going to be inspecting those devices and get get the boroscope that matches that from a diameter standpoint, as well as the length, because you want to have enough length to get through stuff, but you don't want to have, you know, a jump rope 
at the workstation, you know, all over the, you know, bouncing all over the place. So, I mean, unless you're bored <laughs> and you just want a very <laughs> expensive, you don't get a lot of steps out. just standing at the workstation. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, well yeah those fitbits are so crappy because you do get steps like as you're assembling it, it just counting steps yeah. you're sitting there putting together a tray and you get like a thousand steps you're like i have not moved from this table i could guarantee you i have not walked a thousand steps but anyway <laughs> that's, that's another story so we love talking about the things that the normal you know, sterile processing technician or department leader doesn't know. That's why we talk to guys and gals like you that have insight that, you know, the rest of us don't have. So can you maybe give us a couple of things that the average SPD or may not know about sporoscopes? I think the biggest aha thing that I, I could think of that comes to mind is, and it's the best part of my job, going into a department where someone's been working on a device for many years, reprocessing it, thousands of times and they've never looked on the inside they're not they don't know what it looks like uh inside there they don't know exactly what some of the twists and turns and, and corners and crevices that kind of that's that's awesome and th i think if there's kind of the aha or fulfilling part of, of what i get to do is is giving people that that visual because I know that everyone that works in this department cares. They don't, they want to do their best every day. They know that the job's important to keep people, you know, patients safe and healthy. And now being able to look inside to me is just probably the most, in my mind, the most powerful tool to get, to get this done right moving forward. It's a whole nother world. Like you said, like same thing with magnification, like the first time that you put a magnifier on one of these instruments you've been processing your whole life you're like oh my goodness like this is what that crack looks <laughs> like and these are all the bugs that could be like hanging out underneath the tape or, or what have you but yeah i can totally see that boroscope point of kind of you know taking you behind the scenes i guess that's kind of why folks like the the shows like how it's made because you get to see that that piece that's the spirit of the beyond the tour film series that we started actually beyond clean to take folks, you know, to where the manufacturing is being done. That's another place. Like they get to see all the devices. They never get to see how they're actually created and like who's behind the design and, and the assembly and all that jazz. So that's a great point to highlight. And I think a lot of folks will be nodding their heads like, yep. I remember the first time I looked in the boroscope and I was like, oh my goodness, I need to do this yeah. more often. <laughs> yeah. I, so I, that's not exactly answering your question, but it's the first thing that comes to mind is like, Wow. Holy smokes. That's what that's what this looks like in there. So, Andy, we started this interview kind of randomly asking you about the future of disposable scopes or single use scopes. And I want to close actually talking about the topic of this interview with which is the future of boroscope. So what's your kind of crystal ball or as Justin likes to say, if you put on your future looking goggles to look into the next five to 10 years in this technology, what should we expect to see? What are maybe some going to be some surprises out there that folks weren't expecting, but you think is going to come anyways? Yeah. So our goal is to not make this process more complicated. It's to be quicker and it's more primarily to be more effective. My guess is that the boroscope is going to be one of these leading tools. There's a lot of other really cool and great technology that's coming out. So I, I, I don't want to just put boroscopes up on that pedestal, but I think this tool is going to allow us to see spots that we all can improve, whether it's better technology on things like, you know, brushes, or maybe it's, it's on the, you know, the personal side where it's, I need, we need to spend more time in this area of the device. I think that's going to, that the boroscope is going to help with that. I also think though, that this is not just on our department. I, I think this is a tool that provides pictures, which is very interesting because pictures in my mind are worth way more than a thousand words in this situation. You know, we're going to be able to see things and document them and maybe try to find more root cause stuff. Maybe it's not brushes. Maybe it's devices that are getting used inside of these devices. Maybe it's different chemicals ways that these devices are manufactured, I, but I don't know exactly what it'll be, but I think there's going to be a lot of things that will help us be better collectively as, as a whole, you know, 
Healthcare Collaborative. All right, Andy, really great job. I love hearing about this technology. I also am reassured by the fact that bringing it into the department doesn't add to the laundry list of trainings that needs to happen. I mean, I'm sure that when we start to see stuff we've never seen before, that there's some element of it there, you know, figuring out, okay, what's our policy? What's our procedure on that? But as far as like the care and the maintenance and how to use it, everything else is, is very, I think, easily indoctrinated into the workflow that already exists. And I absolutely love that you can pass it through the washer disinfector as well. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Keep up the great work and I really appreciate you guys. That was Andy Sundit, Sales and Marketing Manager at Claris Medical LLC. And we're talking about boroscopes, taking a deep dive and very interesting perspective. I think more and more we're seeing adoption of this technology, but there's tons of room for more adoption. And I think being able to see areas of scopes and other pieces of equipment that we haven't been able to visualize in the past is super critical. We've talked about this before, but this really came from a completely different sort of perspective, I think, Hank, and it's more about like the ownership of this equipment, which is very much in theme as we wrap up this season, very much in theme with what we've been talking about. And I love the four Ds, just making sure that you know what to be looking for when inspecting scopes using the Boris scope, those four Ds being debris, damage, discoloration and droplets because moisture is a killer to these electronic instruments, especially if it can get in there, get at the wiring and start eating away, corroding, or just simply short circuiting the technology. I mean, let's be honest though, Justin, you like the forties because it reminds you that, (laughs) that you used to be young at some point in your forties. Okay. No. <laughs> As I watch my forties pass before my eyes, you're absolutely right. I didn't have any problem turning 40, but now I'm on the back end of it. looking at 50. Uh, yeah, I do. I do look upon the forties. So, uh, there's a great country song out there for all you country connoisseurs, uh, classic country. It's called the backside of 40. Go look it up by a guy named John Conley. Uh, highly recommend. A smooth velvet voice, you're going to love it. Okay, <laughs> but back to the point here. I love boroscopes. No surprise, I kind of showed my cards in that interview, obviously. Critical technology. And even like the question that I threw out to Andy, even those of us who have managed to get the budget and be justified to buy it, oftentimes we end up, it just kind of sits over there on the shelf, you know, taunting us, but not helping us to fight dirty better. So I really want to leave this interview with that charge to the listeners that if you have one, you know, get it back in service and process, get your folks trained, get it comfortable and start using this as often as you can to make your instrument safer. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. But as a reminder, you can help support Beyond Clean by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or simply search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We also have bonus content for many of our episodes and vendor spotlights, but you can't get it unless you download our smartphone app for iPhone or Android. So make sure you do that. Don't stop listening to this episode until you've gone over to the app marketplace and downloaded it. And by the way, while you're there, give us a rating and a review because the feedback that you provide us here at the show is really important. And speaking of feedback, if you have any topics or guests that you'd like us to consider for a future episode, just send an email on over to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Beyond Clean. Beyond Clean.